try to. <laughs> These are authentic extrapolations of Rodney's emotions and thoughts and history. Everything that he has experienced as a human being is kind of reverse and poured into his work. Well, thank you very much for that. I'm going to ask that the host and the other um, Leslie mute their microphones if you don't mind. Thank you very much. So I see people are still coming in, but I think it's a great time just to introduce myself and also introduce our panelists who we're so lucky to have here today. Um, I'm really thrilled to have everyone here. You can see their faces, but soon you will know all about them and the inner workings of their minds. Uh, so I want to thank everybody for joining us today about, for a discussion about fashion photography as art. I'm Catherine mm -hmm. Steinberg. I've been working really closely with Rodney Smith's estate on making space for conversations like this one, which honor his work. This is our inaugural event. We're so pleased to have our four incredible panelists with us today. First, we have Paul Martineau, curator of photographs at the J. Paul Getty Museum in Los Angeles. You can wave, Paul, well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> He's also the author of the forthcoming book on Rodney. Next, we have Ethleen Staley, a partner at the Staley Wise Gallery in New York. You can wave. Thank you. <laughs> um, she represents the work of Rodney Smith. Dennis Friedman, the founding creative director of W Magazine, can also give a little bit of a wave. He's commissioned, thank you, a lot of Rodney's work. Um, and Victoria Vamosi, an international model. She was a subject of some of Rodney's most indelible images, which you can actually see behind her right now. <laughs> so thank you again. And a big thank you to the estate of Rodney Smith for hosting this event. Um, I'm gonna begin by giving each of our panelists just a minute to tell us how they got involved with fashion photography. Mm -hmm. And Ethleen, I'd love it if you could kick us off. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about your personal story and how did you come to open your gallery and represent fashion photography? Okay, well, I was a stylist for a very long time and uh, always worked with photographers. That's what I knew. And a friend, a photographer called Charlie Harbutt was taking, taking a loft in Soho. And he said, why don't you take a call? loft and have a gallery and I said why not and I enlisted my good friend Jackie Wise we became partners and uh, we opened a very tiny gallery 40 years ago and we're still at it and we did fashion photography nobody else had done it before and we got a lot of uh, laughs at doing it and really? And we're still doing it, but it caught on and everybody else got on the bandwagon. And here we are 40 years later, still at it. Uh, I'm very happy to show Rodney Smith. And that's my story. <laughs> we're very happy that you showed Rodney Smith's work and we're happy to have you here. A pioneer, a pioneer in the fashion photography industry. Definitely. Yeah. Amazing. Well, Paul, I mean, you agree. Um, oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was 1981, and no one was showing fashion photographs. No one valued them. They were uh, left. <laughs> exactly. And Ethelene and her partner were really the first ones in this country to dedicate a gallery to this. And it's really an amazing gallery. Uh, when I was putting together um, Icons of Style, I um, visited many times, and we looked through the entire inventory. It was a really great experience. Yeah, can you tell us for more me about too. Style? For me too. I'm sorry, Kat, what was that? 
Oh, no, that's okay. I was asking if you could tell us a little bit about icons of style because I oh, love of course. more color around that. Yes, um, that was a show that I did in 2018 along with a catalog. Um, the idea to do a show on fashion started um, when I was working on Herb Ritz LA Style. And I realized that because Herb had done so much fashion work, I needed to understand better what the permanent collection at the Getty had by way of fashion. Um, so I, I went through the boxes and looked at the work and I realized that there was a potential, although long term, uh, for a show on fashion photography. And at that moment, I really didn't know what it what would be, uh, but I started collecting photographs and learning more about them, uh, fashion photographs that is. And over the next 10 years or so, I added 70 pictures by 25 different photographers to the collection and started planning the show and the book, which covers a hundred years of fashion photography. I have the book here. I was gonna say, you do it, with you? it looks like you have a nice prop. Yes. Beautiful. And then of course the back is a back. Uh -huh. <laughs> clever. That's very clever. And the person that's uh, represented on the front is the great fashion photographer, Sarah Moon. Yeah. Amazing. Um, and one of the goals of the book was to cover 100 years of fashion photography because the only book that really did that was produced in 1979 by Nancy Hall Duncan. Wow. Um, there was a book in the 90s. Uh, that covered from 1945 to 1992. Um, so there really wasn't anything that had reappraised the situation and added more uh, makers in. So in the book, I included the work of over a hundred photographers. And a lot of them were, I think, relatively unknown to the general public. You know, figures like Korkin Pachanian or Ray Kelman or Wynne Richards, who actually was the first woman uh, photographer to be hired to produce photographs for Vogue in the 19-teens. And um, she, she changed her name to Wynne because her real name was Martha. And, <laughs> and uh, she realized, somebody advised her, if you use Martha, you're just not gonna get any respect. So you, you have to make them think you're a man. Wow. Um, thank you so much for that. I sure. really appreciate all that backstory and you're so good at situating all of this within a historical context. Um, I really, really appreciate that. I'm actually wanna turn to Dennis right now and have yeah. you talk about your history and you know what, what was the ethos behind W Magazine when you were founding it? It was sort of like an upstart as I understand well, it. Well, yeah, you could say it was an upstart. Uh, it was a long shot probably more than an upstart. Uh, it was an extraordinary time uh, and it was, uh, I was fortunate to be at what was then Fairchild Publications, which had never produced a consumer magazine. Uh, so there was no infrastructure at all. And basically it was John Fairchild saying, um, we're gonna, from a tabloid, we're going to be a, a perfect bound fashion magazine coming out about the same time as uh, Harper's Bazaar under Liz Tilbaris. Um, and I was the creative director and I had no, no assistance, no uh, <laughs> nobody but me. And the beauty of that was I also had no, um, we didn't have meetings. I literally was left to my own devices. And that is, that. even then, that was extraordinary. And my love was photography, I have to admit. I was uh, looking at William Eggleston, not you know, uh, fashion. I mean, I was aware of fashion photography. There were certain photographers I liked, but my real interest was, you know, I was an uh, art major in school was photography. And I applied that to the magazine. I believed that there was an audience uh, that would appreciate uh, honesty, uh, more truth, uh, 
a depiction of women that was more realistic, less uh, as uh, vessels for clothes. And uh, I also had the liberty to make stories 20 pages, 30 pages, and incorporate anything I wanted from a poem to a portrait of, uh, you know, Eudora Welty. Uh, it, the most exciting part was that it turned out there was an audience and a huge audience and uh, W uh, was an unlikely success uh, and I believe it was because of a belief in the importance the power and the ability to communicate through images that's um well said beautifully said and it's interesting because I think both you and Ethleen broke through um in mm -hmm. a way yeah and I, I love that you're both here talking about it and I want to get to Victoria. Yeah. It's true. Um, I want to hear, Victoria, I want to hear your story, but then I also want to sort of situate all of this new things going on with fashion photography and the respect it's gaining um, within the context of Rodney's work as well, because both of you really, um, you know, were huge fans and gave him such a wonderful platform for people to discover him. So in the meantime, Victoria, can you tell us a little bit how you got started modeling and what it was like to work with Rodney? Sure, sure. Yeah, so I was born and raised in Hungary, Budapest, and it wasn't really my dream to become a model, but you know, sometimes life just sort of happens. And when I was 19, my mom tragically died. He, she was 49. She was a, a seamstress, so she used to put whole collections together. And because I was quite tall, like, um, yeah, like 5'10-ish by age 15. So she would fit the whole collection on me. And it wasn't a completely foreign territory for me, but this was definitely not my dream. But when she, she passed away and I just couldn't face reality and I, and I decided to move away from home basically. And, and I went to Paris because I studied French in high school and I thought that it, I don't know, it might be a good idea to go to Paris. And this is how I, I started modeling. And this is, it actually became a career. And then three and a half years later, I moved to New York and this is when I met Rodney first. Well, it's never a bad idea to go to Paris. I'm just gonna put that out there. <laughs> Always a good idea. Um, and what was it like for you to work with him as a model? And I, I understand from getting to know him a little bit even after his death, um, that he worked with models a little bit differently than other fashion photographers did. So I'm curious what your experience was like. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember really clearly that like in the morning he would always be ready. He was always be in a good mood. He had a really good sense of humor. He would always be prepared and, and focused, organized. And actually sometimes when, when you know, the, the crew arrived, like the, the stylist, the hair, makeup, the models, it almost felt like that, that, you know, it made a mess in his like well-organized life. And I really hope that it wasn't always the case. And when I first saw his garage, for example, like, I mean, literally we could eat off the floor. It was so clean. His house was, I don't know, like a, like a museum. So everything was, was spotless, always, always. And so it was a bit unreal, but, but also reassuring in a way. So I usually arrived really relaxed to the shoots because I knew that, that he knew exactly what he wanted to do. And then, so I just sort of have to fear that space that he imagined for me with exactly who I was. So, you know, I wasn't expected to act in any way and just to be myself. And what he liked, I think, was usually closed mouth, um, like a, a strong, but like open facial expression, you know, simple, nothing crazy. So um, I always felt that I'm in, in good hands and there was, there was this very strong order around him always. So yeah, every detail matters. Yeah, can we show, I think we have a couple of pictures just to put up that you were featured in um, that we're gonna show. There you are with your mouth closed, just like you said. And there <laughs> you are again in the clock. <laughs> um, it's really- oh, Voila. Again. Yeah. 
without, I can't see your face at all, but I like it. <laughs> Such a beautiful photograph. I think both Paul, you and Dennis um, had mentioned sort of Rodney's world building and his creation. And Dennis, you said yesterday that to be a success, you have to be meticulous. Can you talk a little bit about that? Just sort of elaborate on what Tori has well, I think the word I think I used was obsessive. Um, <laughs> and that doesn't necessarily mean meticulous, uh, although Rodney was. Uh, and, and frankly, I think any creative person, uh, if they're to be uh, six, really, uh, rise above the, the crowd has to be obsessive. I don't see any other way. Um, but the obsessiveness does not have to be about the particular thing they're doing. I mean, I would be interested in a photographer who was obsessive about neurosurgery. It would affect their work. They would see it in a unique way. And um, Rodney was, of course, he was obsessive and meticulous. Uh, his work was, I, I was attracted to it because I believe that a successful magazine had to have a uh, carefully edited uh, uh, group of individual voices. It's not so easy to find and that each photographer brought their vision to the magazine. When I saw Rodney's work, I realized that he, he possessed a very particular way of seeing the world. And there was this, uh, of course, uh, surrealistic, poetic, and in some ways, anti-fashion. His pictures were not and that for me was appealing mm -hmm. because it wasn't dictated by the clothes and W was never dictated by clothes. It was dictated, it was concentrated on the woman wearing the clothes. Who was she? What is she? Uh, and, and in Rodney's case, it was more the voice and the imagery that Rodney created. Really, it was clear, reflected his view of, of a particular world. To me, a fantasy world, a poetic world, a world that Magritte inhabited maybe. And that was an important juxtaposition to other photographers. Um, it's great that you say Magritte because Paul, we've talked about this of at course. length. Um, <laughs> yeah. And you know, getting to know Rodney, you know, after his death posthumously, yeah. how do you experience his influences and his work and his particular personal um, strong brand of style? Well, certainly, when I look at the work, I can see connections to. Uh, Northern Renaissance painters in terms of how he's using the light yeah. and uh, his color combinations in his later work when he began using color uh, photography. Um, I see many connections to surrealism. Um, there are Hitch Hitchcockian influences. Um, so all these things are a great kind of intellectual turn on uh, when I see pictures and then it lights up uh, uh, rings a bell, um, signaling something from the past that I can make, uh, draw a thread or a line to. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, 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 I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm back. Um, but is that how you experienced Rodney's work? What drew you to it when you first saw his images? Well, I, I had seen his images years ago in advertising, uh, but I never knew who he was. And it was in the context of considering this project that I, be, I made the connection uh, to who he was and started to do research and read his blog and come to know who he was in a much deeper way. 
if you um, you know spend several months during research um, on a particular artist, um, in the end, sometimes you come to know them in a way that not even the family knows them. And um, I've had instances where um, the artists who I've worked on um, in, in, in the first review, I didn't know that I liked them personally, but by the end, they became part of my family, like all the people I work on. That's really great. Really um, <laughs> Ethelene, what do you do to Rodney's work? Did I think of Rodney's work? What, what it, drew you to it when you first- Well, you know, it was original, mm. unique, really didn't look like anybody else's work. It still doesn't. A lot right. of, a lot of uh, photographers were drawn to surrealism and they did it in their own way, but I don't think anybody did it quite like Rodney. And I don't think he really influenced anybody. I think he was sui generis. And uh, I think as a, having a gallery, that's what we look for, originality and uh, some, something special that nobody else does. And that's what Rodney had with those, with his ears, with his leaping. Yeah. With his back to the, to the camera, with his uh, chaplain figures. I mean, there was nothing like it. Still is. And that, that's so rare, don't you think? Yes. There's so many people that tend to go through the kind of history of photography and they, you know, take influences and it looks like this person one week and that person's the next week. Uh, but that wasn't the case with his work. Right. Yeah, really Dennis, one. can you think? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. That's all. One of a kind. The only one. That's it. <laughs> I would say that's absolutely true. And I was curious because you commissioned him for some work, Dennis. And can you think of uh, a shoot that really stood out to you? Well, you know, we did a few, but what we, and, and that was the only way I could imagine working. Rodney worked on location and his work, uh, I think it, it was and always critical that you are able to do, you know, to make, uh, give the photographer the best possible uh, support, meaning whether it's casting, hair, makeup, or location. And I remember we, uh, I, you know, it was very almost logical for me to think of the connection in some ways to the simplicity of Shaker architecture, uh, of which I was a huge, um, uh, I, I have great respect for it, its purity, its honesty, its, uh, in, in, and its poetry. And I thought that it would allow Rodney uh, a number of opportunities to create uh, strong images. And he certainly did. I mean, that was uh, a very memorable uh, uh, group of photographs. Um, and I think that's something that I kind of wish more whether it's magazines or brands, if they were more uh, sensitive or understanding of, the, of their photographer they commission to help them make great pictures. Uh, and there are many times when it's just the opposite. I know a lot of very talented photographers who are thrown into a situation which in many ways uh, is detrimental to their work. And yeah, what can uh, get in the way of making art? Because we're sorry? talking about, I said, what can get in the way of making art? Well, yeah, it's inappropriate. It's, and, and whenever I, I chose to work with artists and it wasn't because they were famous or it was a big name, 
It was because their work, their personal work, I, I think of Philip Locker de Corcha's one, used artifice. His pictures were composed. They were uh, created by him. And I thought, well, we're in many ways the perfect vehicle because we can help him create an image and we can hopefully give him tools that he usually doesn't have. And in fact, that was the case uh, because we did have many tools, hair, makeup, and also because we weren't tied in to showing particular fashion. We weren't looking at trends. We were more or less dressing a particular woman. Mm -hmm. So when we worked together, the clothes were chosen to, in many ways, make the photographs more uh, honest. And with him and all photographers and Rodney too, you really have to think, where are we going to, where, what we can do for Rodney? to make his yeah, work. Yeah, so it's a collaboration. It was like a, a very total collaboration. collaborative process. And it's and funny because we have Victoria here who is yeah. the woman that he's dressing. So Victoria, can yeah. you tell us, you know, did you feel like it was a collaboration between you and Rodney? And did you get a sense of the woman that he was trying to portray in all of his work? Absolutely, absolutely. And actually when, when Dennis mentioned honesty, I immediately thought about how, you know, he only used film and, and light. And this is something that I absolutely adored in him, especially because I started modeling in the 90s. Mm -hmm. And this is what, you know, it was normal in the 90s. But it was so refreshing, you know, in the era of this heavy retouching and, and digital work. And just to see this one, like, super, like, skilled man owning it and having full control over what's happening there having that magic wand and he's the only one using it it just it made me happy because you know when in this digital world it's kind of it's sad when i can see that sort of everyone is is you know fighting over what how a photograph should look like so they i feel that you know they they taking that power away from right. the photographer who has the experience, the skill set, the talent. And yeah, so it's just sad. And it was so refreshing and it was really amazing with Rodney that he had it all under control and it was, you know, it was in his hands and only in his hands. I'd when like it comes to add one thing because uh, Victoria is uh, talking about working with Rodney. I think one thing that most people overlook is the the model, who she is, how she can. No photographer can take a great picture without a, uh, a subject, a model who can give him what he needs and in fact, surprise him. And in all the years, you, it's not about a particular face. It's not about a particular height there are certain women who really make pictures. Krista McNenemy made pictures. Uh, Linda, uh, Kay, they made pictures. They understood how to communicate with their, whether they were acting or not. In fact, Kay Moss, her greatest, uh, I think attribute was her purity. Kate, there wasn't a false bone in her body. She would laugh, it's because she laughed. She, she never, there was never a false moment with her. So she was and authentic. that is what yes. made her great and right. not her, uh, you know, everything else about her. She was as pure, and direct as anyone I've ever seen. And if no one's seen it, I, I just, 
uh, I read two years ago, I guess, Mario Sorrenti, who was her lover, uh, told me that he had a whole, oh my God, he had an archive of photographs he took of Kate before he was a photographer and before she really was modeling, they were lovers. And it was extraordinary and then we published a book and, and in that book you can see that same uh, it complete lack she rarely had clothes on but it wasn't about being sexual it was just she was comfortable mm -hmm. uh, and i think for photographers uh, it's so important to find a muse hopefully more than one. Yeah, I think uh, Bradley actually had a few of- uh, He had a few yeah. and Victoria <laughs> was able to help him make those pictures. And so you can't, and I've always been, and I'll shut up after that. I've always <laughs> been disappointed in magazines that are books about fashion photography when there isn't a credit for hair, makeup, uh, stylist, no picture is without that, not one. And, and I think that their contribution should be acknowledged because, uh, you know, uh, someone like Pat McGrath, I mean, Stephen Mizell could not make those pictures without Pat McGrath or uh, so, that's something hopefully uh, will be recognized is their uh, in critical role in making a photograph. Yeah, Paul, I think you were going to say oh, something yes. earlier. I was going to talk about authenticity and how important it is to evaluating photographs. Um, and, you know, I do this all the time, uh, but I can look at pictures that I really know and feel it when it's real. And it represents the vision and authorship of a photographer who has his own sense and his own control over what he's doing. Um, I think if you try to make pictures by committee, yes, a lot of people contribute, but you can't make pictures by committee that have any authenticity and power. No. That emotional power that shows up in many of Rodney's work um, is palpable. What do you mean by committee? I'm curious about your um, take on that. If you have lots of um, art, uh, directors, you know, art directors and um, clients that are there um, looking over your shoulder, making suggestions about what you should do and shouldn't do, that's a recipe for disaster. Um, you really need the freedom uh, to play and experiment and um, and it's in those cases that the best work gets done. Yeah. Uh, because it's gotta come from inside you um, or it's not gonna have that true emotional connection that makes sure. a picture powerful. And I think one thing that people don't necessarily know about, nor would they, it's also in many cases, most cases, the photographers are not given the uh, opportunity to edit and lay out their stories. That's right. almost unheard of. Uh, I mean, at W, that was the golden rule because for me to work with, and I was usually on, on the set, we were building something that falls apart. What are we gonna hand it over to someone else to decide? That to me is uh, devastating and I would never. So every photographer laid out, well, together we would lay out the story because in a magazine, it's not the individual picture and it wasn't with Rodney. You have to string together. It's not mm -hmm. a museum. You're, you're, it's more like a film. And you have to be able to put that together. And I know I'm going to get in trouble, but I, I don't care. One of the things that really confused me and frankly still does 
I won't name names, but most major fashion magazines today, who, is the, who are these women in the pictures? They're not. They are vessels for clothes. And the thing that I never understood was how women never like thought, or I, I never hear it. Who is that girl jumping in the air? Who is that girl with a smile constantly? Why is this magazine, I've never seen a girl without one or happy. And to me, it's demeaning. It also, I finally realized it's because to most editors, images are not as important as words. You would never see a story written as poorly as, as falsely, as completely you know, dishonest well, I know as a that. photograph. I'm, I'm curious about, you know, Ethelene, your experience as yeah. a woman starting this fashion gallery and looking at Rodney's work. Did you feel like it was a story? Did you get a sense of the woman that he was trying to portray? And did you connect with his vision? Well, it, the ones I liked the best were the contemplative women. And that's what most of them were. They were thoughtful. Mm -hmm. They were into themselves. They were shrouded in landscape or veils. And the, he had a particular woman. She didn't she wasn't expressive really, but expressed him, I think. Yeah. In her in inward looking. I know that he had a very special relationship with his female models and he liked the models that he saw that were somewhat mysterious, somewhat enigmatic, and he couldn't really figure them out. And uh, that really appealed, that feminine mystery really appealed to him. And that's and what came to that come through. And he spent a lot of time making sure that the circumstances that the model was working in were comfortable for her. Um, if she was shy, he would send all the assistants away and just work with her um, until she was comfortable uh, but, to be expressive. But Dennis yeah. felt that Rodney, that you knew them. No, the I'm here. Other photographers, women came alive. They were always sort of shrouded in mystery. You mean his women? Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. think what you said was really insightful. The women in his pictures expressed, were able to express him. He was the subject. And that- I, I like that as well. Really yes. uh, extraordinary. And, but that's not easy for women like Victoria could do that. And it's very clear when you hear, I just met Victoria, yeah, uh, but I know immediately why she was so able to give him that because her, you, the intelligence, the- uh, Focus. I would say, it, it's so clear. You yeah, know, Victoria, I and saw you- Rodney, had to have seen that immediately. She was willing to put a lampshade over her uh, face. Well, yeah. Anything. <laughs> Anything. 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 I was also kind of head up in a chimney. Yeah. I think we, also, we have a photo of that. But I also think that Rodney probably did not want to figure us out because he needed that, right. that level of mystery and maybe just kind of like, you know, unwrapping little bits and pieces that he needed in that time, but left every, everything else wrapped. So I, yeah, think I, I saw you kind of uh, light up a, a little spark when Paul mentioned if she was shy, he would send the assistants away. <laughs> Did you experience him sort of creating an environment for you? He, I mean, I, I haven't seen a model being uncomfortable on, on his shoe. It's just the way he, he was like from, you know, minute one, when we arrived, he really made sure that everyone's comfortable. And, you know, as I said, he really had a good sense of humor. And I think humor is probably one of the most important things 
a human being can have or needs to have. And he had it and he had it. And then he just, everything was at ease. But also he had, he had a crew that he worked together all the time. You know, with modeling, it often happens that you go on different shoots every day and these are different people for the day. So you have like 10 minutes to kind of loosen up a bit, warm up a bit, because you have to bring the best out of that one day where you're working with that team. Whereas with Rodney, he had, he had his um, team that he worked with all the time. Um, you know that around that year, the same year, uh, we had another tragic loss. Uh, his um, stylist Renata, who yeah, who was creating all these amazing and often huge, like really large props. She was she was the the mind behind at least part of that creativity. She was really amazing. So it was it was really devastating for the whole team. When, yeah. when both Rodney and Renata passed. I mean, to Dennis's point about it being a group effort and taking sort of a village to create this magnificent moment, yeah. um, I can really feel that from everything that you're saying. And we spent a lot of time talking about how Rodney worked with uh, female models, Victoria, you but, being a key case in point. Um, but Paul, can you, I remember we talked to Reed for a little while right. and I was wondering, you know, it's been said he worked differently with female models and male models. And I'd love for you to kind of give us your insight as to what it was like with the male models. Well, the type of models really depended on whether they were male or female. That he was looking for certain types of female models and certain types of male models. And in male models, he liked men that were acrobatic and willing to, and brave, and willing to do feats of daring do. Um, and Reed Kelly uh, was one of his favorites. And uh, Reed loved to um, kind of experiment uh, while they were doing a shoot. In one case, he asked uh, Smith if he could hang off of the side of a, a tall building. <laughs> and Smith said, oh, no, I don't think you should do that. Yeah. But he had a kind of wink, a sparkle in his eye that suggested that you should just try it quick before the security comes. And um, so we did it and uh, he took the picture. And of course, the uh, one of the people that represented the building, I think, um, was um, saying, I can't look. But then when Reed got over the side of the ledge and was holding on, she's like, oh, don't you think you should put his tie out? <laughs> So everyone was happy and he, he was safe and he crawled back up and it made a great and interesting picture. Um, so they um, had this really great kind of pal relationship uh, where he would you really try and exceed Smith's expectations and in doing so came, uh, created some very interesting imagery. But I think he was also a special case, wasn't he? Because he also played Spider-Man on Broadway. Yes, yes. He, <laughs> he was very fit because he, was, he studied ballet and he was an acrobat. So he was prepared to do these kinds of things, climbing up trees and um, walking on stilts and things like that. How did Rodney discover him? Does anybody know? I, I'm curious if he. That's a great question. Yeah. And I don't know the answer to that, but yeah, I want to find out now. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I assume it wasn't going through a book of, uh, you know, Wilhelmina. I'm sure he <laughs> found him probably in some other way and realized how important oh. those skills were. Right. I remember Reed telling us that um, on the first shoot that they did together, he was dressed in a suit and Rodney said they were on a beach and Rodney said, just, you know, go down there. And then he said, keep on going. Yeah. So then keep on going. And he's like, do you want me in the water? And he said, yes. Yeah. So it was like up to his waist in the ocean yeah. in a three piece suit. 
Right. So he said, oh, this guy's not going to be like the rest of the guys I work for. This yeah. is going to be interesting and fun. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, sure. Ethelene, when you are looking at Rodney's photographs, and we're talking about all of this work with, you know, Victoria and the lampshade on her head and, you know, Reed hanging off the side of a building, mm -hmm. is it this sense of excitement and mystery and uh, precariousness that draws you, or is it something else in the work? You no, know, I think there's something very sad about those male figures. It's hard to, to describe, but there's a kind of loneliness and uh, sadness of, about almost ch chaplain esque. Uh, something very, very look, looking inward. And I don't think they're fun. I think they're very sad, the male, the male figures sleeping around. I can see that in some ways because Rodney wasn't an athlete. And so maybe that expressed some of his desire to be more like those men that he was depicting. Um, but there's also a certain joie de vivre in some of the pictures where they're jumping. Well, uh, they're almost cartoony, almost like cartoon figures. They were so slim. And yes, they're very slim. They were very slim. He had a type. He had a type. And yeah. he had a long, you know, not pun semi intentional, a reedy man. Um, yeah. But I would say what everyone's describing, and I think what we all experience as viewers, is Rodney reflecting on himself and putting yeah. that in the photographs. And is that something I want? I'd like each of your perspectives. Is that what takes the art to the next level? Is it I the artist's the ability to do that? I, I think that what meant, that's part of his originality is that I, the loneliness that, that to me that's what I see. I don't I don't see a lot of fun in those pictures, in in the landscapes. It's a like a lone a lonely figure. Mm -hmm. they're, they're very intense and inward looking. I said that already, but yeah, I, I think that that's like his character. What I what. The little I know about him, I think those pictures reflect him and his how he feels about himself. Yeah, I, I think he did have some conflict within his family that might have been, you know, poured outward into his photographs with his father. Um, but I, I think on kind of a universal level, we all feel lonely sometimes, and we can all sort of put ourselves in that um, emotional position. I'm curious. Sort of just Rodney, hmm. Rodney was an outsider in many ways, and that gives you a unique perspective on life. And um, that, that is, is an advantage to an artist, I think. Yeah, Victoria and, and Dennis, would you say that Rodney's work being able to be self-reflective is what elevated it to the next level or would you pinpoint that on something else because not all fashion photographers I would say you know become these recognized artists but I think we all can agree that his work is at that level. Uh, what I find very fascinating about his work is basically uh, what was just said it's that he produced images that were layered. They were ambiguous. Your first impression is of, could be humor, but on second viewing, third viewing, fourth viewing, all of a sudden you get the loneliness, the sadness. And I think for any work of art, and I'm including his, there needs to be ambiguity. Definitely. There has to be a revelation. It can't be the first impression. And I've always believed that images that you get it all, the minute you see it are clearly what they are, one dimensional. And you'll and forget about those pictures. Yes, I mean, the, it's so great that, brought up the issue of loneliness and sadness. And of course, comedians many times are the most right. lonely 
and tragic figures. And there's a reason they're comedians. There's a reason they're deceiving, you know, putting on a facade. And I think that that's the key to the strength of Rodney's pictures. Um, speaking about, I would say the strength of his work, I would love it now, um, Patricia, if you could pull up the photographs that Paul has so kindly yeah. added to the permanent collection at the Getty. Um, and Paul, if you wouldn't mind when they come up, just talking us through a little bit about why you selected those images and what it is about these that really spoke to you. Oh goodness, this one is just so beautiful. Um, the colors, and uh, I think here Rodney is playing with issues of scale uh, because this is a really petite model and she's out on the airplane wing amid this expanse of sea and sky. Um, so she looks even smaller than she actually is. But yeah, a, really, a really amazing, unforgettable picture. Yeah, Trisha, if we can go, oh, there you go. I love this one. Actually, I love them all. So that, that's not to <laughs> So this one's uh, humorous in a way because it's showing um, a figure, and I think it's Rodney's son, um, holding up a Polaroid of Rodney taking a picture. So it's a picture within a picture within a picture kind of thing. There are all these different levels of reality that are going on um, in it. And Rodney didn't like to have his picture taken like many photographers. And um, so this is one case where he's able to kind of um, insert himself in a picture without kind of feeling the anxiety of being photographed directly and having that be presented to the world. So you have to kind of search for him within this picture to find him. Mm. And of course, the uh, clothing that Jonah, his son is wearing um, represents, um, you know, the kind of theme of his work for men, you know, this kind of well-dressed, um, uh, hatted, hat-wearing uh, gentleman. Um, so it, it's, it's a portrait of a portrait. This is great. Um, oh, here's the next one. This is maybe a Reed Kelly one. <laughs> Yes, this is a Reed Kelly one where he's jumping from one building to the next. And uh, this one conjures the work of Martin Munkachi, right. uh, who was the, a photojournalist um, in the 1930s. And he was hired by Carmel Snow to reinvigorate the photographs program at Harper's Bazaar. Um, she uh, left Vogue and she understood that she had to modernize the magazines, magazines photographic program in order to make it compete with Volk. Um, and so Munkachi was the first person to add movement uh, into fashion photography. And he used the 35 millimeter camera. So the pictures were grainy uh, too. And, and that wasn't something that was generally accepted in high-end magazines. Yeah, let's see the next one. Oh. Ah. This is a great one. This is Taxi New York, uh, where he's assembled 30 taxi cabs um, under this bridge. And I love how the bridge acts as a kind of proscenium stage for these two models. Uh, they're being presented to us like they were um, acting in a theater production. And um, it, while the um, art direction instructed him to use taxi cabs, um, there were no other restrictions as to what he could do. Uh, so he had the models there and it wasn't until uh, he was working with them that he decided he would put the models on top of the taxi. And, um, and he had to build a platform uh, so that he could take the picture properly. So the, all his assistants were scurrying around to all the kind of uh, alleys looking for pallets to build up um, a platform for him and his camera. Uh, the staging of that shot is incredible. Oh, I love, I love this too. This one was um, 
when they were on the way to uh, another place to make a picture and Rodney saw this field and asked them to stop the car and he got out and sent somebody, I think, to ask permission to use the field for photography and had his model standing on the uh, hay bale and then jumping up as if he was jumping over. Uh, but jumping over like that really wouldn't have been possible because mm -hmm. it's just too high. <laughs> no, and this is really a love letter in pictures. It's uh, Leslie Simolin and Rodney on their honeymoon uh, in Italy. And um, they were walking down the street and they came upon a, a closed shop in a shop window with a mirror. And Rodney set up the picture and, and, and shot it. Um, so it is one of the uh, self-portraits as well. And um, I love the fact that you can see uh, reflected in the mirror, the two people that are passing down the street and they're looking, the man is looking back to see the magic that's happening mm -hmm. uh, as Rodney's building this picture. Mm -hmm. Great. Oh, and this is an example of a, a picture that uh, in one context, um, it suggests in the context of an ad uh, which was done for a champagne company named Dushan Boulogne. Uh, it looks, um, it looks very, uh, it's, it sends the message that the, uh, the wine is well cared for and, and there's perfection in the production of the wine. Um, but without the ad, it seems menacing. Like these figures are automatons and they're going to uh, go haywire and, you know, cut us all up. <laughs> yeah. And this is one of Rodney's more famous pictures, uh, the twins in a tree. And uh, it's taken at Sneedon's Landing where he established his home and studio. And it became the backdrop for many pictures that he created during his oh, wow. uh, late career. Um, and uh, this picture is really all about the body language of the two figures. Um, that one is looking down, one is bending back, backwards. And it seems like even though these two uh, uh, models are twins, uh, <laughs> the distance between them is insurmountable. Ah, a very elegant picture that was created in the Burden Mansion in New York City. Uh, with one of Rodney's muses. Um, and here he's using the light uh, that's streaming in the window to end the reflection of the model uh, to give this uh, picture depth and intensity. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this one's called the question mark picture. And, um, you know, it. It raises, it raises questions. I mean, that's an apt title for it. Um, you know, what are these people doing? What are they thinking? And what are we supposed to think when we're looking at it? It's a conundrum. It's that sense to of be mystery solved. that we were all talking yes, about, right? exactly. I know. Thank you, you know, so and, much for that oh, tour. And I just wanted to say in assembling these pictures, I wanted to have the very best of Rodney's work uh, as it related to fashion photography uh, from his early career in the early 90s through to his later work in uh, the 2000s. Can I say something about the extreme elegance of every photograph? They're really perfection. And in a gallery context, the prints are so beautifully done. Yes. They're they're I was, very special. I was very impressed when I saw the physical quality. prints. Incredible quality. Yes, because a number of them had different tonalities. And um, that's something we really look for. An artist who doesn't just think of pictures as images, but as objects. Yeah. That's super important because um, I can't really decide how to print an image if somebody gives me a negative or a file because there are so many different decisions that have to go into that um, end product. They're really perfection. Every, every print 
is perfection. That's beautifully said. We are actually um, just at time and I want to open the floor to all of our panelists here. First, to thank you because you're so generous with your time uh, and to see if there's any final thoughts that you wanted to impart. And I want to mention for all the people in the chat that we're recording this and it will be posted. So sign up for the newsletter, check the website and check all Rodney's social media to find out where you can watch this or share it with friends. Um, but in the meantime, is there are there any final parting words that anyone would like to say? I think I just said mine. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it so, was it was perfect. Um, so thank and, you. And for me, it was interesting to hear. I think it's so important to hear the other three panelists because they bring another you know uh, aspect of Rodney's work that I wasn't aware of. I mean, and so it also speaks to the fact that his work is multifaceted, that you can talk about it from many angles. That is rare. And uh, I, I'm, I'm uh, proud to be part of this group because I learned a lot just listening to what each of you had to say. We could yes. take a <laughs> I said, I guess I would say that, um, you know, trying to put your finger on what makes a fashion photo photograph art isn't quite easy because there are so many different things that go into that. And it really depends on your own perspective. Um, I did see a very funny um, cartoon recently um, that said, had a picture of a man in a gallery and he was talking to the gallerist and there were pictures on the wall. and. Um, the man asked the gallerist, what makes a photograph art? And the gallerist said, if it sells. Yes. <laughs> so I thought that was very cute. I know that's not what you do, Ethelene. Yeah, it, it has a lot to do with it. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> we wouldn't but, um, still be here. That's yeah. authenticity right there. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but for my part, I think um, the answer is in part uh, the fact that um, a fashion photographer uh, photograph can be the reflection of two different worlds or more, the perfection of what's in the frame and the reality of what lies outside the frame. Um, so you have this duality and these very many levels of uh, fantasy and reality that are coming together in one picture. Mm -hmm. um, so when I see that happening, it intrigues me. Extremely, extremely well said. Um, oh, thank you. No, very. I, everyone in this panel is very eloquent, so I feel lucky. Um, you're all making me look good. <laughs> um, as I said, and Victoria, I'm sorry, did I cut you off? Um, um, no, I was just going to say that, like, just the, the images, it brought up so many memories that I, it's not that I, I, I forgot about, but obviously when you know yeah. they just come back like for example um the first photo right the lady on the uh, lady was the girl on the airplane i went for the casting for that job i think it was for for condé nast travelers and they were shooting it in um, in dominican republic and i really really wanted to go i remember because of rodney and also because <laughs> dominican republic but they um they wanted someone, you know, not with these coloring, but they wanted someone darker hair, just a different complexion. Mm -hmm. And then some of his obsessions. So, for example, the fog machine. We didn't really talk about the fog machine. Yeah, I was going to ask was one about of that. Things. And I remember like so many times, you know, you're on location and that fog needs to fly in a certain direction, from a certain direction. And then sometimes he had his assistants just like, running like behind you for like, I'm not saying for hours on, but for, you know, quite some time until he got that fog right. And the, and the sun rays, the rays of sun was, mm -hmm. you know, cutting through exactly the way that he imagined it to be. Mm -hmm. So all these like small things just really came out really sharply. So I do miss him a lot. I, I think 
we would have seen so much more from him. Um, yeah. It's really, you know, a gift that we got as much as we did, but we would have seen, I think, incredible things. And I will say that this is the first in a series. So if you enjoyed this conversation, please come back. We'll be sharing news and updates and maybe we'll just host another panel on the fog machines. Maybe we'll invite <laughs> the fog machine to sit on the panel. <laughs> <laughs> But thank you all so much. Everybody have a wonderful night. And thank you again to the estate of Rodney Smith and our panelists. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Happy to be here. Likewise. Bye. Bye. Have a good night. You